You are listening to Breaking Boundaries with Brad Palumbo. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I'm really glad you guys are back with me. Uh, thousands of people downloaded and listened to last week's episode with Blair White, so I really appreciate that. Um, really getting an overwhelming response for a show so new. So really appreciate you being here with us today. And I've got a great guest, uh, my colleague and friend, Tiana Lowe from the Washington Examiner. She's a, a commentary staff writer and journalist, uh, and she also is a regular on Fox News and Fox Business. She covers everything, but especially 2020, uh, economics, Me Too, feminism, and, and more. So Tiana, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Brad. Maybe to start, just uh, tell, the, tell the listeners a little bit about your background. I know you're from California, and that's one of the things I want to talk about. So kind of where you're from, what you're, where you grew up, your, your formation politically, and, and tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the fun thing about where I grew up for the most part in Orange County is that it for many decades was the final red bulwark against a very blue coast. So even though a lot of my social life was mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, I grew up with a lot of the Chamber of Commerce type Republicans, very much a, a backbone of the rank and file Republican voter. And in 2018, every single district in Orange County wound up blue. So oh. that's the background that I come from. And you, um, you went to USC, right? Yes, I went to USC at the peak of all of its sexual abuse scandals, all of its investigation by Title IX. And this is the one where when liberals like to eviscerate Betsy DeVos as disempowering Title IX, I see how stringent she has been against USC and rightfully so. And I, I think it's a little bit of a misplaced ire. Um, and mm -hmm. then also going to school in Los Angeles as a journalist. I mean, that wasn't my major, but that's what I was doing every hour. I wasn't in math and economics classes. During the whole Me Too thing, it really gave me a purpose to my career because that's not a left-wing issue. That's not a right-wing issue. That is a women's issue. Right. And and we can get into more of that in a little bit. But um, two questions that, that kind of pop out is one, were you already kind of politically conservative at that point? And was USC like a liberal campus? What was that like, that dynamic? So I am a descendant of four grandparents who all escaped communism. And even though my parents were very apolitical people, mm -hmm. they would not tell me who they voted for in elections when I was when I was much younger. I still had that backbone of just anti-communism. So I was much more of a hippie, anti-war libertarian as a kid, and then <laughs> sort of grew into probably a little bit more of a pragmatic mold of a traditional conservative as I got older. USC is interesting because it, it socially and historically has been a fairly conservative campus. Um, but that's sort of where I saw this emergent culture war um, you know, you could have entire sororities and fraternities filled with a mm. bunch of people who probably support Joe Biden in this election. But the ones who were controlling student government and the student newspaper and pretty much every student sanctioned organization, they were the burn it all down Antifa left. I mean, so the you, amount of. Did you get sorry, involved with campus journalism like on campus or was that kind of did they push you out? So I was a columnist for the Daily Trojan. And honestly, I left that position and started to branch out my own network with the TAB, which is a British owned media company that supplied much of mm -hmm. infrastructure for, for independent journalism. After I realized how much they were trying to push this very dubious race hoax, this very dubious hate crime oh, wow. hoax or hate statement co hoax against Greek row. And mind you, I never rush for a sorority. Can you even imagine like how poorly I would tolerate being being told how to like suck up to people? No. But I <laughs> but I fundamentally believe in the right of free assembly. And especially on a college campus that is mostly urban and most buildings are not on campus associated with it. And so that's why I then started my own thing. I did not like the way there was clearly a political agenda and one that was endorsed by the university. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, we'll, I'll, we'll detour here a little bit and then we'll kind of detour back. You really hate dorms. Why do you, you, you think that first year college students should not live in dorms? And I have to be honest with you, that's just not an opinion I've ever heard anyone other than you articulate, but you feel it very strongly. So lay the case out for our listeners. Okay, so up until 100 years ago, when you turned 18, out of the house, find a job, cook for yourself, take care of yourself, you don't have some RA around to nanny you. It is a very strange concept that we send students, not just to perfectly fine B-list schools like USC, but to Yale and Harvard and the Trinity and tell them that they are not capable of cooking themselves breakfast and having an RA to what, like quell them if they're smoking pot in their dorms. It's just a weird phenomenon to me. And, and I'm sort of personally, I can always attest to, so I spent my freshman year in Paris, right? And we all lived in apartments because mm-hmm. that was, I mean, obviously there was university assistance with the housing project. It was, a, it was a private company they had licensed out. So it wasn't like we were just thrown into the deep and I would taken what, three, four years of French. It wasn't like I could, I could negotiate with a landlord to make sure I had like the right rental insurance. But it was a really, really positive experience. It made me convinced that I was a functioning adult who was able to take care of myself. And I think a lot of what we are dealing with, with a lot of this, like everyone lives on campus now, these style of of histrionics, a lot of it does come from, from day one, we say that when you're a legal adult, you cannot take care of yourself. I mean, and also as a side note, I remember at USC, I had a couple of, I think they're now the editors of the USC Economics Review who took over after I did. And they would say in their dorms, one of them had a socialism sucks, like Turning Point USA uh, Mm -hmm. sign in their dorm. And the RA called them out over the sign and said, it makes people feel unsafe. That just doesn't happen when you are in a (laughs) private renter shit, you know. Yeah, so I guess I have two questions there because I your point is taken about the kind of safetyism and the ideology. I mean, my dorms had care bears on the walls that reminded students to brush their teeth at night. So like I get where you're coming from when it when we're talking about we're raising, you know, literal legal adults and we're treating them like children. I guess the two concerns that I have that I'm curious what your your uh, kind of rebuttal would be is one that like whether we like it or not, a lot of 18-year-olds really aren't prepared to just go out on their own and kind of be full adults. I know I know some, uh, my sister's age, who they've been coddled by their parents and I feel like you gotta ease, ease them into it based on where they're at. And two, I at least made most of my friends from my college dorm and from living on campus my first year. Uh, how would you get a start socially without dorms? Again, it, it, it's hard for me to draw a direct personal point of comparison. Cause again, like I, I was, mm-hmm in France, so it wasn't the same experience. But I am very much in favor of the idea that school should be treated as a way to increase your market value in the workplace. And a lot of that drove much of my socialization. Like I am still very good friends with my former work colleagues from my part-time jobs that I had in college Mm -hmm. and my internships that I had in the summers. Humans are social beings. And that is what overwhelmingly this pandemic has displayed. We will fight tooth and nail to make sure that we can still see people and meet people. And it's a lot, we can decry Greek life or lefty student organizations, but these are all just ways that people get to know one another. Mm-hmm. That is so much of the formative college experience. And, and not to digress at all, but I think that's a huge issue that you and I both have with journalists who rail on the stupid stuff that an 18 year old does. You should have the license to try out communism, try out anarchism, not burn stuff down as we've seen in all of Portland. But then figure, <laughs> but, but rework your values and rework your beliefs without it having career consequences. And that's, that, if there's any safetyism that should be allowed on campus, it should be that. 
the right for you to socialize and learn who you are. Also, demanding that you take care of yourself and also demanding that you no longer act as though you're a child. But I, and that's just a part of it. No, that makes sense. I guess kind of zooming out from the campus, I, it'd be it'd be good to talk about California more broadly because, I mean, you grew up there and you're a, a whiz on economics. Um, and it, so you've kind of witnessed this firsthand and then political observers like me and you have, have talked a lot about this. But California, when you adjust for the cost of living is the poverty capital of the United States, right? And you're seeing like people fleeing it to to better pastures as, as taxes and everything just gets increasingly out of control. Uh, what do you think the main, first off, do you think that, that California's decline is exaggerated or real? And what do you think the biggest policy problems are driving it? So the, the decline is very real, is very real, and COVID obviously heightens it. Anyone who moves to a left-wing area, as you and I know, like I am fine in principle paying heavier taxes for most social services. The issue with California is prior to the pandemic, you would be paying what, up to half your income in taxes, depending on how much you make, for social services that criminalize homelessness and the overwhelming majority of the homeless male population in Los Angeles that I can speak to, um, statistically speaking, it, it suffers from either a mental illness or a drug abuse problem. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was already one factor. Now you're saying, okay, I'm still going to pay out the button taxes, but yeah. the police aren't going to be funded. And all of the least privileged children in the state are not going to be taught in school. They're going to have to do the, the sham that is distance learning. Yeah. And it, it, it becomes even more absurd when you realize 40% of Los Angeles County is on state-ran healthcare. And if you look at the obesity rates, and if you look at the morbidity and mortality rates, it's egregious. And at a certain point, you know, California has some of the, I think, the best wildlife in America, for sure. You are one hour away from a surf or from a ski, almost anywhere in the state, as long as you're close to the coast. And I think the the, the music and the art, you know, you could, coronavirus has rapidly shown how little that is worth when you have a state and local government that is just fine with shutting it all down. So you can't go outside and do things because it's illegal, but you can't go in your backyard because the state is so horribly mismanaged wildfires that it's not safe to breathe in it. And so to that, I say, like, I just don't know how you can be not yet established and live in California. If you're a millionaire, great. If you have a stable two-parent income and your kids are done with college and you're not paying for any of that, sure. I just don't see how young people like us could live there right. and, and, and how to be worth it. No, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because the next thing I, I want to ask you about it is relevant to that. But you've got to make you make a good point, right? You've got to make a state pretty bad with that kind of like beautiful nature and wildlife and so many like natural attractions. They kind of were they were like dealt a really good hand. And so they've got to really mess it up to get people leaving in exodus to Texas. Uh, yeah. But I guess you just kind of hit the nail on the head, because what the next thing I was going to ask you about was uh, the AB5 controversy, right? So for listeners who haven't heard of this and maybe don't follow your rants and my rants about it on Twitter, California basically passed a law that makes freelance work at all, even close to approximating a full-time income illegal. Congresswoman uh, or state representative, uh, Lorena Gonzalez, I believe, she introduced this law that would literally make it um, illegal to write a weekly column for a newspaper without them hiring you as a full salaried benefit employee. So for me, like that, that what I'm doing right now, writing for a bunch of different places, like loving my work, work, making my own hours illegal in California. Right. <laughs> uh, so I guess maybe can you, and, and it actually looks like it's going to chase Uber and Lyft out of the state. I guess the question I have for you is, how does that kind of dysfunction gain popular support in California? Like normal people that you know from California, how do they look at that and, and reelect those people? So the difficulty is that California is functionally an autocracy. You know, uh, we don't have 
a real opposition party. The Republican Party has ceased to become irrelevant, whether on a federal or on a local level. So unlike in New York, where there's still ample attention aimed towards the New York City Council, mm -hmm. um, there, there are still intra-party controversies. California, it's almost like they are governing sheep who will just kind of go along. And the interesting thing about AB5, which you just brought up, is that that bill has more of my California friends, who I know from my pre-political times, who are mm -hmm. very apolitical, it has more of them coming forward, livid, because their personal incomes are affected. Because I know a lot of freelance sports writers who now cannot write. They cannot make their incomes. Yep. And especially to have this happen during a pandemic where we already have significantly higher unemployment than we had last year, that makes it even harder. I don't know what the good answer is. I think there's a reason why a lot of the California Republicans who come to DC are a little bit of the more outlandish set. You know, you have like the Devin <laughs> Nunes, it's, it's nothing against him. The party infrastructure is just rotten to the core. They don't know which races are winnable. You know, young Kim was slated on election night in 2018 to become the first Korean American woman ever to join the United States Congress. The California GOP did not fund her enough. They did not realize she was winning such an easily winnable race, both literally and in terms of the narrative. And so she lost after mail-in ballots. Uh, ballot mm -hmm. harvesting is a huge issue. Ballot harvesting is not technically illegal, but the idea that you can have an entire state of Democratic Party operatives scoop up ballots around the state requiring no effort on individual voters that's an issue. That's pretty sketchy. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess then, do you think people will continue to leave the state? Is that how it will be solved by like voting with their feet? Uh, that's the only solution because it, there is clearly no voter incentive. There is the, you just have to choose between more Democrat or less Democrat. You know, like, <laughs> like this is one where I, I wish California had their own Andrew Yang someone who was a Democrat, but like thought Same. more like a technocrat. Because the, the problem isn't the left versus right. The problem is that we're no longer even pretending that your taxes have to have some sort of return on their investment. So yeah, I think people will continue to leave. And especially as, I mean, you and I follow these social issues very closely, but if you look at the polling on gay marriage and weed legalization, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly, Republicans are socially supportive of these things so long as it isn't thrust upon them. So I don't think from a cultural perspective, many Republicans from California have a problem with moving to, I don't know, Colorado, a purple state, or Austin, Texas, where you get a lot of the benefits of the music and the culture and a sort of healthy social liberalism, but you have Greg Abbott. And I just don't see how else it ends. I mean, like, like my parents are fine in California because they're established and mm -hmm. run a business but it's getting, it's getting hard. And it used to be when I lived in LA, I lived like walking distance from Skid Row. Mine, it was like a 30 minute walk, but I walked everywhere because it's California and there's not really functioning public transit. Of course. It now has just spilled out into the open. I mean, you have Eric Garcetti shutting down Rodeo Drive just to wow. let rioters run rampant. It's unlivable. It's well, unlivable. I guess, I guess the question too then is, is part of the great American system is federalism, right? We have 50 mini lab laboratories for th what works and what doesn't. And California is supposed to be an example of people leave because it's not working right now. But I guess part of the problem, and you've written a lot about this, you understand it better than I do. When you have salt deductions or you have like a, a intrastate bailout uh, as, as kind of Democrats and Nancy Pelosi are fighting to include in the next coronavirus package, that doesn't work, right? No, and especially it is it is hilarious that the takeaway of the 2020 election with Joe Biden, this doddering almost 80 year old former BFF of Barack Obama being the last final and only bulwark against Bernie Sanders and the left is for Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer to try and push what is effectively a tax cut for the rich 
in coronavirus panic packages. It, it just goes to show how, how thinly the Democrats do believe in redistribution. I mean, so if you look at the math on the salt, uh, on, the, on the salt deduction cap, it only goes to the rich. Now, those are the only people affected, even in a state like California where everyone's taxed out of the wazoo. And so that, those are their instincts, you know? I mean, I mean, we see it with Nancy Pelosi's champagne socialism of we're gonna advocate for right. all the lockdowns and personally blame Trump for every life lost while I treat myself to a blowout and then put the salon owner on blast. <laughs> and she's pointing out the hypocrisy of sauntering around a salon without a mask while salons weren't even supposed to be open. Right. Um. No, I mean, I get your frustration. If I lived in California, I would I would be livid. Uh, but I guess I want to shift gears slightly because one of the other really interesting things that you've written a lot about and thought a lot about is kind of the Me Too era because, and I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you come at it from a different perspective than either side. And I, I feel like I sympathize a lot with your perspective where you're not like a traditionalist who opposes all feminism, but you're not a, a left-wing feminist either who shouts their abortion. Uh, <laughs> what do you think? Is there is that is your view kind of like a conservative feminism, or or what does that mean to you? So I know that Christina Hoff Summers uses the term equity feminism, and like I, I would say that I, I do roughly agree with that. We have had historically, and still have clearly, movements opposing racism not because we believe one race is actually better than another, but because we have historical injustices against black and brown and minority folks. The same is true of sexism. In a perfect world, you wouldn't actually have to think of it, right? right. Um, but we do not live in a perfect world. And one of the things that, I, that I, I sort of think that conservatives really dropped the ball on was the Me Too moment was the opportunity for the right to not only advance law and order, because the big issue is that I, I, I don't have the statistics offhand, but it's something like five in every 100 rapes go to trial. Right. But really also small point, amount. But also point out, <laughs> abortion is not the red flag banner issue of feminism. It is workplace sexual harassment, misconduct, and... Uh, rape and domestic violence and they just sort of you know i i was sorry i'm just closing out of this window real quickly um i don't want to pop that um and there was obviously a lot of momentum behind the rightful prosecution of harvey weinstein who we can now finally legally say is a rapist uh, despite decades mm -hmm. of covering it up but then a lot of stories just really fell through the cracks you know, I discussed this with Megan Kelly for the Washington Examiner uh, magazine cover, and we were. She won't speak on the record specifically about her experience at NBC, but the narrative that I've constructed and that all the facts corroborate is the idea of had NBC silenced Ronan Farrow's reporting into Weinstein specifically because Weinstein mm -hmm. had dirt on Matt Lauer, which just goes to show how deep the rot is. Conservatives are totally right to say that our current Title IX system sucks because it only favors the wealthy. And if you are a wealthy woman with an ax to grind with an ex, it is very easy to get someone punished without their due process, right? Right. But this, is, this may not be a one in every five woman issue, but if this is a one in every 20 woman issue, that's right. a hell of a lot more important than overturning Roe v. Wade, which wouldn't do much anyway in states like California, where there's an abortion clinic on every block, in states like Missouri, where there's only one in the entire state. The so, real thing is much bigger. Do you, so you, I mean, you would agree with me then that, that the kind of the Me Too moment started in a really good way, with a really good sentiment and, and progression. Uh, but would you also agree that, that it in, in some ways has devolved uh, into something ugly? Uh, uh, when you think of the way like Brett Kavanaugh was treated and they published totally ridiculous, salacious allegations against him, when you look at like the, the weird story about Aziz Ansari and some of this other stuff. So do you agree that it's 
descended somewhat into into rougher territory? Oh, absolutely. The Me Too movement didn't die, it was murdered. And in, in, and in large part, it was murdered by the left. Going all in on the Christine Blasey Ford issue was such a monumental mistake, not just pragmatically, but also morally, but think about it, pragmatically, mm -hmm. Brett Kavanaugh was hand-picked by Anthony Kennedy. This is someone who we can all fairly assume probably would not overturn Roe, even though Roe, as I said, doesn't really matter. They latched onto an allegation that not only has no inculpatory evidence, but arguably has exculpatory evidence based on Leland Kaiser now coming forward and saying, not only does no one say this party could have happened, but she, the person the most likely to take Ford's side on the issue, doubts that this was even a possibility. There was no evidence for that. And then we saw, in any sane world, the loss of Hillary Clinton would have been such an easy way for Democrats to wipe their hands clean of the stain of Bill Clinton. This is someone who, I, I, if we're talking about decades old rape allegations that are highly credible, Juanita Broderick takes the cake. She has multiple people still willing to go on the record saying, not only did she allege that she was raped by Bill Clinton, but also that he bit her on the lip and she still had the visible bite mark, which is something that one of Clinton's other alleged lovers said that he liked to do sexually. Mm -hmm. And instead of going forward with, we are just gonna wipe our hands clean of the Clinton men. Bill Clinton, speaking of the DNC, two years after they tried to railroad Kavanaugh with a totally baseless sexual assault allegation. And then the Julie Swetnick thing, what right. a farce, what a farce. And so then by the time Tara Reid comes out with a claim that I would say is credible, though not proven to the preponderance of evidence. And this is against the, Joe Biden. Yes, and yes, yeah, so the Tara Reid allegation against Joe Biden, the reason why it is credible is because she has at least one highly credible witness who says that she told her immediately about it after the fact, I would say it definitely doesn't meet the preponderance of evidence, meaning that I don't think it's actionable in the eyes of the voters, because it's it's very hard to take seriously the idea that a sitting United States Senator would, you know, forcibly finger a staffer in an open hallway in the middle of the day, and then no one else comes forward with a similar allegation. But you would like have way, to believe it under the Believe Women standard. Absolutely, and that's the way where I think I, I don't blame I don't blame more cynical conservatives who are like I'm just done with the Me Too thing because I think they're wrong, but I get where that impulse would come from when you just see the rank hypocrisy and the idea that like rape and sexual misconduct and sexual harassment these should not be political issues, and yet the the standard is clearly shifting based on who is accused in the letter that they have next to their name. Right. But I guess that that makes me want to ask you, I know you did a really in-depth piece, which people should check out um, in the Washington Examiner, comparing the totality of all the Me Too allegations against Joe Biden and Trump, respectively. Uh, but am I right in saying that, like, it's really not a both sides thing? It's way, way, way more accusations against Trump. And I guess I, I do struggle not with people like you or like my friend Robbie Suave, who covered the Tara Reid thing. Uh, and pointed out left this hypocrisy, but a lot of the same conservatives that were pouncing on it don't care that Trump has, what, 20 something accusations against him. Uh, so do you think that's hypocrisy? And can you break down what the accusations are against Trump? So obviously, just, just to simplify it, Biden only has one sexual assault allegation against him. The other quote unquote allegations that came forward during the primary, the, the very early days of the primary, before he even jumped in, mm -hmm. they were all about hair sniffing and like weird shoulder touching, not things that creepy Joe stuff. Yeah, nothing that could be qu qualified by a sane human being with a functional prefrontal cortex as <laughs> sexual assault. At the very least, old boomer granddad who doesn't have respect for personal space, which is <laughs> not something that should be actionable in an election against Trump, the real dinger against him is not just the vast magnitude of allegations that 
hint at something that could be classified as sexual battery or sexual assault. But also, yeah, you know what? The Access Hollywood tape, it is one thing when Tara Reid is the only person saying Joe Biden sexually assaulted her in a, in a Senate hallway and no one else comes forward to have a similar remark. Mm -hmm. And Joe Biden has always, always reject, rejected it. With Donald Trump, you don't just have dozens of women alleging that he either grabbed them by their breasts or tried to stick his hand up up their skirts. You also have him bragging on tape about when you're famous, they'll let you do it. And I think a large part of it, honestly, we chose the guy in 2012 who did not have an unchecked library book. And yet Mitt Romney, this total family man, this total anti-racist, this just good hearted chamber of commerce, mm -hmm. former governor was eviscerated as a sexist, as a racist, every, I mean, Harry V got away with just saying Mitt Romney didn't pay taxes. It got away with it and the media was just okay with it. So then, you know what? Throw in the guy who actually says sexist things and maybe did them and throw in the guy who says racist things. Republican voters are just sick of it. And Do so you, I think they just gave Trump a pass because they're like, you know what? If you're going to go after the actual good guy like that, let's just go to the guy who's willing to drag everyone into the mud. Right. I guess that we, I mean, we've kind of as a society accepted that politics and our politicians character doesn't matter anymore. Um, at least on the Republican side, they they have decided that with Trump. And like you said, there's a lot of trends and reasons that could explain or partially justify that. But at the end of the day, like, do you think we're using the preponderance standard, it's more likely than not that Donald Trump is guilty of at least one of the accusations against him of sexual assault? I would certainly say so. So offhand, I guess the most damning allegation would be Summer Zervos, who was a former Apprentice contestant, if I'm recalling the story completely correct. It's that her, if you look at the timing of the allegations, they were not politically motivated. She had multiple sources willing to go on the record in court for a civil wow. suit allegation. Um, and mind you, she did not allege literal rape. She alleged that the president tried to penetrate her with his fingers. I believe that's, and, and, and quite frankly for me, that's disqualifying. Like if I ever hopefully have a daughter, I'm just not going to tell them that I voted for that. Mind you, 2020, there's a bit of a sunk cost of a Trump presidency, right? Like it, he's already debased the office pretty much as much as he could. So sure, like I'm not gonna blame anyone for voting now for him. For me, it kind of winds up as like a wash. Like, I don't know, maybe I read in Justin Amash, maybe I read in MVN, just for laughs. It, 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 like, whenever we see reporters so baffled, how could there be anyone sitting on the fence in this election? Because look at what happened at that debate night. You right. have a doddering old fool who you're betting can not only survive four years, but survive them successfully and keep Kamala from turning the entire White House into the DOJ. And then you have Trump where, you know, Trump is given- the court. And packing the court. And it's like Trump has given so many more legislative and judicial victories than I thought possible. And on foreign policy has probably been one of the best presidents in my lifetime, at least. But how do you okay that kind of character? That's the dilemma I'm dealing with. Again, so I still don't know what I'm gonna do on election day, but the, the personal element of it, especially for women voters, something that is so discounted by a lot of conservative strategists is just how on a visceral level, we feel about Trump's behavior towards women. So I guess let me ask you about this then, because I'm more plugged into libertarian party circles. A lot of the memes you see or the tweets that go blow up in those circles about Joe Jorgensen is basically like you're choosing. It's like, why well, choose between the rapist and the, the creepy uh, toucher of women when you could have a woman candidate instead? And they've really leaned into that. Do, would you consider voting for Joe Jorgensen and putting your analyst hat on? Do you view her as a serious or legitimate candidate? She's the Libertarian 2020 nominee. So I mean, I've looked into her like a little bit. You know, there, there's some stuff where it's, it is just kind of outlandish. I mean, one of the things that made Gary Johnson such a palatable option is that someone with a proven record of governing like a right. good, sane Republican. And he had Bill Weld of the ticket. 
her running mate, what was um Spike Cohen? Yeah, he he, he was Vermin Supreme, sort of former minion. That's just it's just not a serious candidacy. It and I I give credit to a lot of the Libertarian Party trying. It is such a fatal mistake that Justin Amash is not that nominee, right? Because I, I think Justin Amash. You'd have my like, vote. Like, like in a heartbeat, like um, uh, like Gary Johnson, he comes with a lot of establishment credence. But unlike Gary Johnson, I trust Justin Amash's ability to go on TV for longer than five minutes and not be like, smoking weed. Exactly, exactly. Like you could trust he would he would hold his own, and that would make the media very terrified of him. Um, it's I mean, uh, all credit to Joe Jorgensen. You know, she's obviously a professor. I don't doubt her intelligence. Elections <laughs> have to be practical, and just putting this woman no one has ever heard of into an election where people are so viscerally against Donald Trump is just not a strategic success. So to to kind of keep going on the 2020 trend, uh, I, you write a lot about economics, and you're you're really sharp on kind of the the free market fiscal conservative perspective. What do you think? The how bad would a Biden presidency be for the economy? Because I can picture two scenarios: one where it's kind of like Obama 2.0, and another one where it's kind of like the a really left wing Kamala Harris, not quite Bernie Sanders, but close uh, agenda that's pushed through. Especially if they abolish the filibuster. So, if you're, I mean, Biden looks like he might win. It, it certainly looks. I mean, you can't trust the polls completely, but it's a very real possibility. How do you think that would play out for the economy? So it's hard to say because there are some things where Biden has indicated not even just moderation, but like a good deal of reform. You know, Biden was probably the most pro nuclear energy candidate other than there you I go. think it was like Yang and Buttigieg. And over the long run, a Democrat finally, finally embracing nuclear power as the behemoth against climate change that it is, that in the long run does have some social savings for our GDP. You know, I mean, climate change doesn't cost. But then if you just look at, you have Stephanie Kelton on Biden's economic panel right now, planning on strategy, just the money printer goes burr. And, <laughs> and especially right now with the Fed promising to keep interest rates at basically zero, it, it just creates all this incentive for Democrats, not even the ones who are validly far left, but the ones who just treat the Fed and the Treasury like a grab bag. They have zero incentive to rein in spending. And again, there is a lot of case to be made. And I know they brought up Yang a couple of times, but the reason why I was so fascinated in him as a candidate was how many candidates really thought about like, what is the best return on our investment we can get with taxpayer money? Not like cutting taxes, but by mm -hmm. more effectively reallocating them. And Joe Biden just hasn't demonstrated any of that acuity. And Joe Biden, you know, I mean, if Joe, if, if we had a guarantee that this was going to be the Joe Biden administration, I think a lot more people would vote for him. Not the Harris. Instead of, and that's the fear. The fear is you have Kamala who has to run in the record of California, which we've already addressed as garbage, and Kamala who has had more positions than the Kama Sutra on Medicare for all. Oh my God. So just like, you just trust that. Right. And then I guess to kind of flip the switch, what would you expect from a, a second term Trump presidency in terms of turning the economy back around? I mean, I just was reviewing some census data, actually Federal Reserve data, talking about how from 26 to 2016 to 2019, the economy was really great, frankly. Like it averaged 2.5% GDP growth, not quite 3%, but a lot better than the Obama years. And also household net worth on average went up by a lot in those years. Do you think Trump could effectively turn around the economy? Um, yeah, I mean, how do you evaluate that? So evidently more than the Democrats. I mean, if we just look at state policies, you know, you have Christy Nome getting eviscerated by the national news media and South Dakota is close back to pre-pandemic unemployment rates. And you're on par with Guam, a literal island for coronavirus death rates per capita. Whereas That's you really take good. Andrew, whereas you take Andrew Cuomo's New York, New York State 
did worse than every other country on the planet, except for China, because we can't trust any of the Chinese data, about coronavirus per capita death rate than anywhere else except for New Jersey, which is obviously is similarly a part of a tri-state uh, area. It So yeah, I mean, tr people really underestimate how great the economy was until this hit. We legaled our way into a recession after the first real wage growth in a decade that was disproportionately going to low income and minority earners. We right. had the lowest unemployment rate in half a century. And yeah, and as you pointed out, GDP growth, so on the aggregate. And then we just told everyone to lock it up and go home and everyone just took it lying down. And I, I mean, it's hard to say what exactly has to be done from a legal perspective. I, I There's evidence that PPP, as, as important as it was, it was ultimately more expensive than what we will get back in it in terms of saved businesses. Um, but I think with Trump, he is clearly not going to rummage us into another shutdown. I think he realized what a, what a cataclysmic mistake that was. Um, honestly, the biggest thing Trump did for the economy early on, just undoing the Obama agenda. Just, just deregulate. Yep, and I, that was really it. And just, it just it gave investors confidence you have more people investing, you have more people starting businesses, you have more people hiring. You don't do that when you think the president's going to executive order their way into abolishing your business. Right. No, it, it's a good point. I guess the only thing that I would be very skeptical of is I think we would see a strong economy under a Trump second term. And I, I think we'd see more good deregulation, maybe a payroll tax cut, um, lots of good stuff. I don't think, though, that he's going to do much of anything to rein in the budget crisis or the or the national debt. Do you think any action could happen on that in the next in the next four years if he's reelected? Oh no, and that's the issue, and that and that was the primary reason why when Trump announced on day one, like his presidential campaign, that's why I opposed him. I'm like, I'm not voting for some coward who refuses to tackle the two main sources of our debt, which is social security and Medicaid. Those, it's always funny to me when people, I think there are plenty of things we can reform with our military, military sexual assault. It's something Republican senators have on the floor to reform. It is hilarious when people act like our defense spending, which is what, half of our federal healthcare spending? It's a is, it's a pretty small piece of the budget. It, yeah, it, it's, it's very small because people always like to look at non-discretionary budgets, or people always like to look at discretionary budgets, not non-discretionary. We will not get the debt shrunk. It's it's we have two parties that are driving us towards a fiscal cliff, and the only difference between the Republicans is they're doing it slower because they promote more pro-growth policies. So we can outpace the debt cliff a little bit. It's so just will, a little will bit. we ever address it, time. or not until there's a fiscal crisis? So I think the fiscal crisis is going to go a lot differently than a lot of people think of it. It's not like one day we get a bill and everyone's like pay up. It will start being, it will start as a credit crunch, right? So mm -hmm. for, first of all, it will be federal healthcare providers being unable to pay what they owe. And so you're gonna have this huge crisis of mostly the less privileged, not getting the healthcare that they need. And then it will just be a credit crunch. It will be, you wanna go get a home loan and the bank just won't give you money for it because they know I mean, it, it's going to be slow, right? It'll right. be slow motion disaster. It, 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 and then one day we're going to realize, oh shit, the bill came due four years ago. We didn't address it. And there's just no way to maneuver yourself out of that. Because I mean, if, if we look at what, like the Weimar Republic, we're just going to print money until the point that paper cash becomes less valuable than toilet paper. You need a wheelbarrow and, to go grocery <laughs> shopping. Yeah. I, I, and this is why Powell's insistence on asserting the non-zero interest rate, like I get Trump thinks it might help, but all it's gonna do is incentivize Congress to flush more money down the drain and take the debt crisis less seriously. Right. Well, that's your, your bright future that you all have to look forward to, everybody. <laughs> so uh, we'll, leave, we'll leave it on that note for the serious talk. Now, the, I, the one thing I ask all of my guests that come on the show now is for their most controversial food take. 
Because you know I have mine, but I want to hear yours. I feel like uh, I feel like my most controversial food takes are probably very niche controversial. Um, one of them is any recipe that says to cook with onions, I always do with garlic because I'm like onions are just to me they just overpower a dish. They lack nuance and they just make your breath bad. Um, very niche. Uh, and I, I, I guess. Oh, also, Annie's mac and cheese is better than Kraft. I agree. I agree with yes. that. Okay, the, uh, the, my, the Alfredo with sage in it, that mm -hmm. is bomb. So my, my boyfriend strongly prefers the Kraft, and he, like, gets very mad if we have to eat the Annie's because that's the only one I bought. Uh, so I mostly buy the Kraft now. But I, I, I'm I an OG Annie's mac and cheese kind of guy. Yes. Okay, all right. So, Brad, so you do actually have a good food take. For once. For once, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and thanks for everybody for uh, listening again. If you like this show and you want to support us, the number one thing you can do is make sure you're subscribed on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube and go to the app store or the, the podcast store on iTunes and leave us a rate and review. We, we really appreciate it. And we'll talk again next week. You are listening to Breaking Boundaries with Brad Palumbo.